Hey everybody, I have to admit that the following that I am about to share with you is the result of my ever-changing and <clears throat> ever, I don't want to say evolving because I'm not always sure I'm going in the right direction, but let's just leave it at ever-changing view on the subject of, of foreign labor and importation. Um, Recently, Coffee with Corey put up a video talking about a, a conversation that Steve Jobs had with Barack Obama with regard to domestic jobs. <clears throat> to make a long story short, Steve Jobs told Barack Obama that certain manufacturing jobs and certain processes that Apple Computers does will not come back to America. Um... Uh, they cited in the conversation, if you haven't seen Corey's Coffee with Corey's video, that um, the labor of the Chinese people and some other things is just superior to that of the, the Americans. Let me read, I'm going to read a little something for you myself, and please bear with me. Because this, what I'm about to share with you and read to you, is integral in my understanding of these matters. Let me see. <laughs> Let me get my readings here. The greatest improvements in the productive powers of labor and the greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is anywhere directed or applied seem to have been the effects of the division of labor. The effects of the division of labor in the general business of society will be more easily understood by considering in what manner it operates in some particular manufacturers. It is commonly supposed to be carried furthest in some very trifling ones, not perhaps that it really is carried further in them than in others of more importance, but in those trifling manufactures which are destined to supply the small wants of but a small number of people. The whole number of workmen must necessarily be small, and those employed in every different branch of the work can be, often be collected into the same workhouse and place at once under the view of the spectator. In those great manufactures, on the contrary, which are destined to supply the great wants of the great body of the people, every different branch of work employs so great a number of workmen that it is impossible to collect them all in the same workhouse. We can seldom see more at one time than those employed in one single branch, though in such manufactures, therefore, the work may really be divided into a much greater number of parts than in those of more trifling nature. The division is not near so obvious and has accordingly been much less observed. To take an example, therefore, from a very trifling manufacture, but one in which the division of labor has been very often taken notice of, the trade of a pin maker. A workman not educated in this business, which the division of labor has rendered a distinct trade, nor acquainted with the use of machinery employed in it, to the invention of which the same division of labor has probably given occasion, could scarce, perhaps, with his utmost industry make one pin in a day, and certainly could not make twenty. But in the way in which this business is now carried on, not only the whole work is a peculiar trade, but it is divided into a number of branches, of which the greater part are likewise peculiar trades. One man draws out the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head. To make the head requires two or three distinct operations. To put it on is a peculiar business. To whiten the pen is another. It is even a trade by itself to put them into the paper. And the important business of making a pen is, in this manner, divided into about 18 distinct operations, which in some manufactories are all performed by distinct hands, though in others the same man will sometimes perform two or three of them. I've seen a small manufactory of this kind, 
where ten men only were employed, and where some of them consequently performed two or three distinct operations. But though they were very poor, and therefore but indifferently accommodated with the necessary machinery, they could, when they exerted themselves, make among them about twelve pounds of pins a day. There are in a pound upwards of four thousand pins of middling size. Those ten persons, therefore, could make among them upwards of forty-eight thousand pins in a day. Each person, therefore, making a tenth part of forty-eight thousand pins, might be considered as making four thousand eight hundred pins in a day. But if they had all wrought separately and independently, and without any of them having been educated to this peculiar business, they certainly could not each of them had made twenty, perhaps not one pin in a day. That is certainly not the two hundred and fortieth, perhaps not the four thousand eight hundredth part of what they are at present capable of performing. In consequence of proper division and combination of their different operations. In every other art and manufacture, the effects of the division of labor are similar in what they are in this very trifling one. Though in many of them, labor can neither be so much subdivided nor reduced to so great a simplicity of operation. The division of labor, however, so far as it can be introduced, occasions in every art a proportionable increase of the productive powers of labor. The separation of different trades and employments from one another seems to have taken place in consequence with this advantage. This separation, too, is generally carried furthest in those countries which enjoy the highest degree of industry and improvement. What is the work of one man in a rude state of society? Being generally that of several in an improved one. In every improved society, the farmer is generally nothing but a farmer. The manufacturer, nothing but a manufacturer. The laborer, too which is necessary to produce any one complete manufacture is almost always divided among a great number of hands. How many different trades are employed in each branch of the linen and woolen manufactures, from the growers of the flax and the wool to the bleachers and soothers of linen, or to the dyers and dressers of the cloth? The nature of agriculture indeed does not admit of so many divisions of labor, nor of so complete a separation of one business from another as manufacturers. It is impossible to separate so entirely the business of the grazier from that of the corn farmer, as the trade of the carpenter is commonly separated from that of the smith. The spinner is almost always a distinct person from the weaver, but the plowman, the harrower, the sower of seed, and the reaper of corn are often the same. The occasions for those different sorts of labor returning with the different seasons of the year, it is impossible that one man should be constantly employed in any one of them. This impossibility of making so complete an entire separation of all the different branches of labor employed in agriculture is perhaps the reason why the improvement of the productive power of labor in this art does not always keep pace with the improvements in manufacturers. The most opulent nations indeed generally excel all their labors, neighbors in agriculture as well as in manufacturers, but they are commonly more distinguished by their superiority in the latter than in the former. Their lands are in general better cultivated, and having more labor and expense bestowed upon them, produce more in the proportion to the extent and natural fertility of the ground. Now we got a little bit further into the, um, the agricultural side of it, but I wanted to make mention of it in that um, Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations, which was written, oh man, y'all uh, go ahead and look that up when Adam Smith wrote that. <laughs> He wrote it in the 1700s, uh, you know, well over 200 years ago, in a time when the Industrial Revolution hadn't even taken true, true hold yet. The results of this Industrial Revolution is that you can divide a process down to the point where no special skill is required anymore in the production of the good you get to the point where a person no longer has to understand how a whole thing operates. You get so many guys working together that all they have to do is turn bolt number five, three quarters of a turn all day long. That's all they do. No offense to anyone who undertakes that task. But in the general scheme of things, you can only afford to pay that man so much. And there is global competition in the task of that. You can actually employ an uneducated person to turn a screw three quarters of a turn over and over and over again. There's really nothing to it. And the final production 
and the worth of that labor needs to be recognized in the skill of its process. We can't just pay that guy $30 an hour because we say so. As, as production continues and more and more innovations are made in production, the less we can afford to pay the person to move that bolt three quarters of a turn. So I challenge that the biggest reason why those jobs can't come back to America is because of the tolerance for this division of labor in other countries such as Malaysia, China, Vietnam. You don't have to pay that person seven dollars an hour. You don't have to pay them five dollars an hour. Um, I'm not saying it's right and I'm not saying that the product is better for it. I'm merely pointing these things out in this very long process and what's turning into a long video to to bring to light the purposes behind these processes and how they're unavoidable. Now, if you want to overcome them, the only way to overcome them is not from within. It's by coming up with the next thing. Uh, not just reinventing the wheel or trying to, to punish those who make a better, cheaper, higher quality wheel. It's to make something that's better than the wheel. And that's how innovation moves forward. And it's just the natural process of things.